Welcome everyone to Dance Theater of Harlem's Summerside Chats. I'm Ebony Pittman, Senior Director of Development, and I am thrilled that you all have decided to join us today for this wonderful panel discussion. Moderated by DTH School Director and resident choreographer, Robert Garland, today we welcome seven extraordinary former DTH company artists to share their stories about transitioning from the concert stage to becoming school and artistic directors of companies across the country. The last 10 to 15 minutes will be dedicated to audience Q&A. While the chat function has been disabled, we do invite everyone to submit questions via the Q&A function on your screen. Also, please note that today's panel is being recorded for archival purposes. Without further ado, I turn it to you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Ebony, for that wonderful introduction. We are delighted to be here in this moment uh, where we have learned to use the Zoom platform to uh, transfer, transmit, elucidate important information about Dance of Harlem's beginnings, its middles, and where it's going. But first, before we move on, I'd like to introduce you these artistic directors of their own institutions that Arthur Mitchell, and all have worked with Arthur Mitchell and came from the, the base, basically the birthplace at Dance Theater of Harlem. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce first, if you could spotlight Jarena Carvalho. Uh, Jarena is the artistic director of Live Oak Dance and ballet master at Marigny uh, Opera Ballet. She's a native of Brazil. In fact, in point of fact, um, actually, uh, I did a Brazil intensive uh, last January, and Jarena was part of a Brazil task force for that. But she's native of, 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 of Brazil, and she was an, Amer an American citizen now as of 2011, which uh, I did not know. And Jarena's early training was with a woman, uh, Bally Vera Bublitz in Porto Alegre, um, who I did actually judge her competition recently. She moved to the States to complete her training at the School of American Ballet, and then she danced with Dancer to Harlem's second company, its ensemble, Dancer to Harlem Ensemble. She then did many, many, many solo roles, really beautiful dancer uh, with the company for so long. Uh, did a lot of my work as well, uh, return she did at New Rock. Um, and then in 2004, she moved to New Orleans and performed at New Orleans Ballet Theater, the Sondra Organ Dance Company, during her stay in Houston after Hurricane Katrina. And also in 2009, she received her Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences, magna cum laude from the University of New Orleans. Um, Jarena, just a brief uh, recollection of anything that Arthur Mitchell inspired you with that you've taken into your now uh, school and training your students? Absolutely. I, Mr. Mitchell, I often refer when I'm teaching um, to the things that he taught personally to me, but I also try to bring his energy to the, to the studio. I'm always, ah, having an ah moment. <laughs> we all sound the same. <laughs> yes, and I have some, for some reason, have memorized a lot of the steps that he would give us. So I often will, the same step over and over and, and I always give credit this is a Mr. Mitchell step so you better do it right <laughs> <laughs> yes yes uh, uh can we show the uh continue we'll continue to talk uh Jarena but can we show the asset 01 uh Jarena slideshow uh, she sent us over some pictures of her with some of her students um uh Jarena so teaching down in New Orleans now how is that working for you flesh tone tights yay <laughs> How is that for you? Well, um, I was actually Live Oak Dance was a really successful business, you know, it's mm -hmm. a profit uh, business. It was very successful until the pandemic. And um, you know that uncertainty is something that it's, it's the worst thing for any business, for, for profit or non for profit. So I decided to take a break from having a physical facility. And um, uh, right now I'm focusing on coaching. I have coached for Mob Ballet, mm -hmm. uh, for Col a Colombian student that was auditioning for Nashville Ballet. 
Awesome. So through Zoom. And I'm also focusing a little bit right now on uh, my choreographic career. I have been commissioned to choreograph a new jazz nutcracker. Nice. Yes, an, an adaptation from obviously the classic Tchaikovsky score into a New Orleans jazz. Nice. And with a lot of Brazilian influence. So, <laughs> so thrilled. I mean, every day awesome. I got a new track and I'm so thrilled to be doing that, doing this hiatus. Mm -hmm. um, but we did conduct a little summer intensive with Marini Opera Ballet, my the company that's commissioning this big ballet. Awesome. And uh, so I'm still teaching, Lovely. just uh -huh. adapting to the new normal. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I should take this moment and pause and say, uh, Mob Ballet is uh, Memoirs of Blacks and Ballet, created by a DTH alum, Teresa Howard. Um, it is it is dedicated to. Uh, people of color that have danced with ballet and ballet companies. Uh, so it's not just DTH, but it's dancers from all over. Thank you for that. Nikki Hefko Wilson. Nikki Hefko began her dance training in Mobile, Alabama, and graduated with high honors from Loyola University, New Orleans, with a bachelor and master's degrees in literature and education. She continued her training at Loyola Ballet and the New Orleans Ballet Ensemble before becoming a frequent performer in New Orleans. As a member of DTH, the Institute of Harlem, under the direction of Arthur Mitchell, Nikki toured the States and abroad, dancing DTH repertoire of classical, neoclassical, and contemporary. In 2006, she performed at the White House, captured in a PBS special in performance at the White House, honoring Arthur Mitchell. Uh, additionally, Nikki danced with Le Grand Ballet Canadien. Oh, that's really nice to know. Uh, because another panelist here has your experience there. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera and other companies as a freelance dancer. She's also a choreographer as well. Um, Nikki, let's watch uh, your video first, okay? All right, so let's have asset to Heather and, um, and uh, uh, Jess. Yes, that's how I want you to pull your legs together. Like you're pulling your strawberry milkshake up the straw when you do that saute in fifth position and plie and squeeze. Yes, let's do the other side. And so ladies, when we time to front, do we lead with the heel or the toe? The heel, the heel takes it forward. So can you show that to me, Anna? So you're in first position, squeeze your heels, squeeze your knees and heel goes up front and toes back. Can you do it with more finesse and go quicker? And dynamite go one, oh yes, and come in, two. Let's do it together. Five, six, seven, eight, out, one, and in three. Now you must not fear, get your back. The back has to go around. You're turning with your back. And you have to turn out the back, big, hello. <laughs> All right, clear. Clearly, that's that's recent uh, video because you were masked. Yes. Um, so, so I actually heard Arthur Mitchell at one moment. <laughs> that was kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> it's inevitable. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, Nikki, just a, a, a you know, just a short uh, something about your remembering Arthur Mitchell and how he's kind of impacted how you are uh, pedagogically now as a teacher. Right. Um, I mean, he really is just like the beginning um, in terms of my teaching. I started teaching at Dance Theater of Harlem, I think it was in 2007. That's and, right. Um, Mr. Mitchell was still there and he was heavily, always heavily involved in the school, but I didn't realize how much until I started teaching. And um, before I started teaching, there was the pedagogy meeting with all the teachers. And um, it was so exciting for me because he just informed so much about what it is that I do. And um, he was very present. You know, the first day that um, I love to tell this story, the first day I was teaching a Saturday pre-dance class to three-year-olds. You know, we're teaching, we're going through, I'm away from the door. And um, all of a sudden, all the kids zip up. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> And there he is at the door, you know, he's checking, like, is she going to get it right with the four-year-olds? And uh -huh. um, that was really the thing that informed me was that it's not just the kids who 
might be dancers. It's not just the older students, it's the babies too. And he was always there and always present. And I think that that um, really made a mark on me as a teacher. That yeah, that's awesome. That is important, you know? Yeah, you know, it's so beautiful you raised it. I mean, I think just as a general, as a culture for all of us, mm -hmm. we actually take everyone. It's kind of in our system to do that. We are not exclusive. And sometimes it's actually very hard with that, it you know, is. but but we 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 were trained and raised that way. Right. <laughs> so well, I mean, and I think the thing is is that when even if the child isn't physically as talented as the person next to them, when they're given that same education and they have the same expectation, they they rise to the level. And they the rise. lessons that you learn from that are greater than ballet, which is an Arthur Mitchell thing. Like how many times did we hear you wear the mantle, you represent something larger than yourself. Than yourself, but, exactly, you know, exactly. And, um, hearing that as a dancer is one thing. You think of yourself, oh, well, when I go on stage, I have to do X, Y, and Z. Once you start teaching, it's like, oh, that's what he was talking about. That's what he was talking Yes, you know, after we get through all the introductions, I'm going to talk about that. Because that's something a lot of people do not know, uh, particularly dancing with the company. When did he ever miss a class teaching us? And if he didn't, they were calling to see if he was ill, right? <laughs> yeah, or a performance, but we'll get there. I want to move on to Louise. Louise. You're on mute, Robert. I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, Luis Domingues, I don't know how I ended up on you. Uh, Artistic director Luis Domingues began his ballet training in Mexico City under Sonia Castaneda and Francisco Martinez, both principals of the National Ballet of Mexico. Uh, Mr. Domingues received full scholarships to study in New York at Dance City Harlem and at Ailey, where he studied under such figures as Arthur Mitchell, Frederick Franklin, and many, many others. In 1988, Mr. Dominguez joined the Dance Theater Harlem, where he became a soloist and danced many roles, many beautiful roles. Uh, during the 18 years of touring and working with the company, he performed in theaters all over the world. He, uh, he has worked with a lot of prominent names in the dance world. And I should say, uh, before I forget, that his sister also danced with our company, uh, Elena Dominguez, as well. Um, uh, let's watch this video. It's a recent uh, television clip of, of Lexington uh, uh, Ballet uh, during the pandemic, uh, just talking about our lives during this time. And, and I'd like you to comment on that, Louise. All right, here we go. Asset uh, three, please. Live performance is a thing to behold, but since COVID-19, there hasn't been much to behold. With COVID, this venue is essentially closed to the public, but our artists community here in Lexington are hungry to be able to work again. This week, the Lexington Ballet are performing. They're recording the Nutcracker, which they'll release later this year, so patrons who would have come to see it live can still enjoy the ballet from their own homes. Officials tell me one of the challenges behind putting on this performance has been being in compliance with all the guidelines. The social distancing inside the Lexington Opera House is meticulous and they are using every square inch of the building for the performers. It's those tiny details that we covered to make sure we were going to be safe for this production and many more. And taping out the floor and taping out the dressing rooms and, um, you know, eliminating some of the the toilet facilities and the sinks and, and making sure that we had accommodations. It's been difficult and it's been great. You know, uh, we, we've been very lucky, but we also been very judicious about all of the temperature control, social distancing, everything to the best that we can. Luis Dominguez is the director of the ballet. He says the dancers are excited to perform, even if that means wearing masks and performing to cameras. Far cry from what they're used to. We are doing it because we must and because it's who we are. And it helps us as Americans to go on. Reporting in Lexington, Jim Stratman, WKYT. All right, Luis. 
Um, so that was everyone's life in the during the pandemic. Uh, any uh, comments about that? Well, you know, luckily we are coming out on the other end. Uh, um, we tried to do, uh, we filmed the Nutcracker in October, you know, because we know that by December that there's no way that we're going to be getting people coming to the theater. And we know that it was a gamble. And, uh, you know, normally we are on a two year, two years, we performed the Nutcracker one year, yes, and one year, no in the theater in Lexington, in, in the Opera House. And uh, that year was this year for us. And the income that we received from those performances carry us forward two years, Robert. So we were royally screwed, you know? Right, and right, right. The income that we got uh, from, the, from the filming um, was not enough to keep the company going. So right now, we are, uh, we, the board of directors reassessed. Um, we let the dancers go. We didn't have no choice. We couldn't perform. And we're going to hopefully come back for the 2022, 20, 2023 season. Awesome. And, and, awesome. and it's an interesting in, uh, looking into what do we need? You know, I'm really looking, I'm, I'm like, God, I mean, I remember Arthur Mitchell telling me one day, Luis, I could have been a multimillionaire. I have everything in here. And I was like, but that's why we love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You know? And that is that is absolutely the truth. You know, uh, uh, he showed me the letters of him. They wanted him to go to Hollywood, actually. You know, um, one of the things about Mr. Mitchell was that he was a stunning looking man. Um, and and, and, no one, and no one was like, why are you wasting this in a dance studio? Like I you could be you. Sidney Poitier. I yeah. know. I tell you one interesting story. I was, uh, we recently did a collaboration with Louisville Ballet. Louisville Ballet is a, it's a decent company. They have a, a nice budget, you know, three, yes. maybe four million per year. To me, that's just the dream come true. But now um, we did a collaboration and uh, one of the board, uh, one of the, the board president of Louisville Ballet, I remember her name, when I mentioned to her that uh, my, you know, that I come from Dance Theater of Harlem, she looked at me like, oh my God, Arthur Mitchell, the most beautiful man in the world. That was, I was like, I know. I know, <laughs> yes, we know, we know. Yeah. And that's exactly why this panel is important. It's because, you know, uh, people do not understand often that his progeny, all of his, all of his children are teachers and, and do well in the studio because of that as well. All right, so let me move on. Uh, the next up is Mr. Kevin, the voice Thomas. Yeah, uh, Kevin Thomas began his dance training. He is a Canadian, he's a born Canadian. He began his dance training uh, with the Ecole Supérieure de Danse de Quebec in Montreal, Canada. Thank you. Try not to trip over that French. And he's danced with Le Grand Ballet Canadien, uh, Cleveland, San Jose, and danced at Harlem in New York City. Uh, he joined DTH in 95, 1995, and was promoted to a principal dancer in 99. With DTH, Mr. Thomas' credits are vast. Prodigal Son, Dialogues, Four Temperaments, Othello, Song for Dead Warriors, Troy Games, Equus. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, Mr. Thomas has made guest appearances with the Royal Ballet in London, uh, Complexion's Contemporary Ballet in Fleming Flint, Peter Schaub in Denmark. Uh, and he is the founder of Collage Dance Collective. So let's watch Kevin's asset, please. Uh, this is Kevin, both in the studio with his company and his school. And then we'll pop back, Kevin. Okay. Can I just see that part? The monsters can get around easier because as it is now, the wizards oh. are really one da pa. Oops. You can't be stiff like the ice that's outside. These two are wrong. These two go too back. Try it again. Let me see you run down this diagonal. Five, six, seven, go. One, two, three. I want to change one thing. Then we come straight down into it. So you face out and then face up. Do it one more time. No, more. We should be like a little leaning back. Yes. Let's go back. Bring your middle finger 
Middle finger, ra, up, that's it. And then remember, our elbow has to be lifted like you're hugging a beach ball, right? You don't want to hug your beach ball like that. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, uh, Kevin, uh, uh, Kevin's company has also worked with our current company. Kevin has worked with our current artist director, Virginia Johnson. Uh, they have performed in New York and I believe Washington, D.C. with us, us as well. But I saw all the, all the heads nodding when they heard that Arthur Mitchell, that third <laughs> finger bit, yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Kevin, um, did you uh, ever speak to, was Mr. Mitchell still around when you uh, started Collage? Oh, yes, he was. He actually came and taught at one of our summer intensives. And he had actually showed me in the middle finger, he said, you can do this with the little kids. Make glasses. <laughs> and then do that. So I thought that was really, really cool. Oh, wow. That's um, beautiful. And even when I started the company, um, when we became a full-time, you know, contracted 38-week con company. And I was so excited to have dancers there the whole time, you know, working. And of course, within the first, you know, 12 weeks, I was like, oh my God, this is rough. I <laughs> called Mr. Mitchell, I said, I apologize for any time that I was <laughs> being too much, <laughs> you know, because you can see why he was the way he was and why he said those things to get us going. So absolutely, um, absolutely, yes, 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 yes. Um, well, that that's what, absolutely Kevin. He um he definitely was a person that uh, had met challenges within his life, took them on, and made them into fruitful enterprise. Always, you know, and um, I, I mean. If there was anybody who knew how to make lemons out of lemonade, it was that man. <laughs> you know, uh, or yeah, lemonade out of lemons. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, great. All right, let's move on now. Let's move to Nina Gilry and Waverly Lucas. Nina and Waverly. Now they both are fabulous people because. They both have awesome resumes. I'll pop back and forth because they have their own identities. Mr. Yeah. Lucas attended Mary Grove College in Detroit, Michigan, where he conceived uh, the concept and name for the Ballet Ethnic Dance Company. After working with Dance of Harlem and the Atlanta Ballet, he joined the Heart Strings National Tour. Mr. Lucas has created more than 40 ballets, including four full-length ballets. Uh, an urban nutcracker, a leopard tail, a jazzy sleeping beauty, Flying West, and a ballet based off the Pearl Keat Cleage play. Flying based off the Pearl Cleage play, I'm sorry. And an opera, Aida for the Atlanta Opera. After co founding BDC, uh, Ballet Ethnic Dance Company, with his wife, Nina Gilreath, in 1990, uh, in 1990, Mr. Louis, Mr. Lucas's choreography and projects consists of the 1996 Olympic Arts Festival, 1997 Lincoln Center Out of Doors, National Black Arts Festival, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Outreach Program, Dance Africa, and the Dance Soar Development Project, and many, many, many more. Nina Gilreath is his co-founding director and his lovely wife of many, many years. And <laughs> a 31-year dance organization headquartered in a ballet ethnic, which is a 31-year dance organization headquartered in East Point. She also serves as a guest professor, ballet professor at the University of Georgia Dance Department. Her work at the East Athens Educational Dance Center and the collaborative work with many other dance organizations enable her to create an Athens to Atlanta artistic pipeline which continues to serve the mission of ethnic dance, of creating access and opportunity for those who are often overlooked. They have been at this, you guys, for 31 years. A virtual uh, applause for, for them, please, because that's so awesome. Um, I like to watch this clip that we have. I believe it is a, a clip that was uh, made recently. Uh, can we go to that, please, Heather and Jess? 
Hey guys, Jessica Ward here. Welcome to the Atlanta Voice and happy Black Business Monday. Today I'm at Bell Ethnic Dance Company. My name is Waverly T. Lucas II. I am the co-founder, co-artistic director, and resident choreographer for Bell Ethnic Dance Company Incorporated, along with my wife, Nina Gill. Yeah, we're very fortunate through the pandemic to have been able to continue to work and create new works through the pandemic. Uh, just recently, I completed a work that was um, both audio, visual, and digital. Uh, a piece opposites attract and distract, uh, focusing on my work from bare feet to the point shoot on an outdoor stage, um, I love the outdoor stage. We often do our cultural cul-de-sac events, which are free performances for the community. We are located in East Point, Georgia. You can contact us on our website, www.alethnic.org, on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter as well. Thanks for watching. Again, I'm Jessica Ward, and I'll see you right here at the Atlanta Voice next week. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So you guys have been at this for 31 years. The most amazing thing. Uh, you have served the, the Atlanta community for literally decades. Um, I would, as school director for Dancing to Harm, like to thank you for the many, 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 many students that you sent to us that we didn't have to introduce flesh tone tights to that it was already a thing. Um, I'll just, I'd just like to hear something from you both, please, just anything. <laughs> um, one of the things that I think about Mr. Mitchell is that his tenacity, he never gave up and he was such a beautiful <clears throat> coach. He really inspired us in so many ways. In 2014, <clears throat> Mr. Mitchell came to Bell Ethnic and what was exciting is that Lydia Barker Mitchell was in the studio and Moselle Spriggs, who originally brought the Dance Theater of Harlem to Atlanta back in the day to Spelman College. We were all assembled in the studio and Panika was there, Panika Jones, because she was mm -hmm. demonstrating for Mr. Mitchell and he was able to coach our students. So it felt like full circle. The most uh, fascinating thing to me was that I had a chance to say, Mr. Mitchell, how did you do what you did for all of those years, especially after our time and what we do and the fundraising and what it takes to be so present? And he said, I was just my maniacal, just mm -hmm. maniacal. That's mm -hmm. how I did it. Mm -hmm. So it really makes me feel like so full of emotion to see how much of his life that he actually sacrificed. And as young dancers, we did not realize how much that he was giving all the time. And one of the things that I took away from him was just to be present because he was always fully present. And that's what I think the gift that I give to my students that I always, always wanna be there in the moment. And I mean, his presence sometimes was scary when we hear those shoes come up the steps. <laughs> but you know, it takes a lot of commitment, dedication, desire, and knowing that he knew that his mission on earth was to create this amazing vehicle for all of us. It's really very overwhelming for me. Yeah, you know, in the notes that, um, that I sent to you guys, I talked about his ability, his uncanny ability to read a room. It was very, it was, almost, it was supernatural. I, I, I honestly would say that at times. Yeah. He always knew when we were having a good day, bad day, in between, he knew when he needed to crack that whip. There were some people that never got the whip cracked on them. Hello, Melanie person. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so, you know, it was just that kind of uh, awareness. And as you say, Nina, being present, being present. Yeah, yeah. Wave. Yeah, I, I think for me, uh, um, I ended up having actually a special relationship with Mr. Mitchell. Um, of course, a lot of it came from uh, out of uh, my own personal tragedy often, uh, you know, as far as uh, if you remember when um, I got injured, uh, 
in the Soviet Union tour. I remember, um, yeah. Opening night dress rehearsal of, of Dougla, Tbilisi. I am, um, you know, my knee, the massage therapist clipped my knee and I had to go back to the States. And um, Mr. Yeah. Mitchell rode back with me to, um, on the plane. He rode back to the American, to see me off at the American embassy. And I actually, I said, we sat together side by side. I got to really talk to him. And um, what was interesting, I remember the um, stewardess saying, you know, oh, you, you look alike, you know, your son, your son, and, you know, it, 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 and, he, and he, he, that tickled him quite a bit. And, um, you know, but the thing that I remember is basically his drive. It was like, and that was something I think we had kindred spirits, you know, whereas we never, I, you know, I, I, I never looked at what I couldn't do. I just mm -hmm. looked at what was the possibilities and what the expectation was because he expected and every, I think everyone else that were a part about, of, of a dance city of Harlem made sure that I lived up to that, that if I was out on that stage representing Dance Theater of Harlem, that I was going to represent it at its fullest. And, yes. and, I, and I had a legacy of people that, you know, Mr. Mitchell as well, but others yes. as well that I had to live up to. And, and that was the thing that I got most out of hearing him talk, hearing mm -hmm. him about, about Cicely Tyson and all of the other people that were so important to help it build Dance Theater of Harlem. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, thank you, Wade. I mean, that was a really, I never knew that at all. That was a great story. Um, all right, we saved the best for last. Mr. Tyrone Brooks, my brother in crime at Dance Theater Harlem. Uh, he's artistic director of Tallah Tallahassee Ballet. Uh, Tyrone Brooks joined the Tallahassee Ballet as the artistic director in the 2013-14 season. He has a wide range of professional experience, including 18 years as a dancer and principal dancer with the Dance Theater of Harlem in New York City. He's been featured in so many works, Alvin Ailey's The River, Robin's Fancy Free, Butler's Othello, and has danced literally all over the world. He did a wonderful performance in Alan, as Alan Strange in a ballet called Equus, and also our Creole Giselle. He performed the Olympics. Just a wonderful, wonderful person, but then, after be, uh, being a former, he began teaching and coaching here, much like Arthur Mitchell. And it was a beautiful moment because we all got to see that that was a possibility. So uh, without any further ado, let's watch your video, which is a recent one about your company, and then we'll uh, pop back to Tyrone. All right, here we go. Tallahassee Ballet stepping into the great outdoors with this year's spring performance. They're recording it in Tallahassee and surrounding areas for people to watch at home. Oh my goodness, how cool is that? Yeah. Hannah Messier spoke with the folks who put it all together and has the story. Ballet dancers donned with skirts and masks rehearsing for this year's spring performance, taking the show from the stage to Tallahassee streets and beyond. We are filming a variety of different pieces all around the greater Tallahassee area, um, as we say, from concrete to the, to the ocean. Um, so everywhere from on FSU's campus um, to in a wooded area in surrounding Quincy um, to down at the beach. Filling it for audiences, a way for the show to go on as the pandemic continues, giving the community joy and celebrating the Big Bend after a challenging year. Maybe it'll help someone process what's been going on in their lives and in the world. Um, so I just hope it reaches people on a different level than normal theater dance would. The Tallahassee Ballet teaming up with FSU for the project, giving up and coming dancers a chance to step out of class. It was actually really cool. I've never got to work with professional dancers before. I've had master classes, but I've never danced alongside them. And they were really nice and helpful throughout the process. The ballet's director, proud of their dancers who continue to support the company despite COVID-19. There's no word to describe my gratitude and appreciation. And I say that because this entire year, they have not been working under contract. Displaying a passion for movement that leaps beyond the theater. Reporting in Tallahassee, Hannah Messier, WCTV, Eyewitness News. All right, Dancing in the Streets will be available on the Tallahassee Ballet's website from April 16th to May 1st. That performance is free, but of course, donations 
are very much appreciated. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brooke. So uh, you've been at Tallahassee as you, as, 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 since 13, 14. Uh, this moment, this period, uh, how are you surviving? How is it going? You know, I've been reflecting a lot more so, you know, during the pandemic, like most of us. And I realized something because, you know, we all want something right then and now. And I realized even more so, and a lot of this has come from Mr. Mitchell too, is, and he used to always say, keep your eyes on the prize and always remember why are we doing what we're doing. Um, I'm in an institution that's almost 50 years old and I'm, I'm trying to change the culture. And that has not been easy. It isn't easy, mm. but, I, but at the same time, I'm doing making baby steps because the Tallahassee Valley is known for doing just the classical works. But I've changed all that since, since I you know, became artistic director in regards to making the repertoire more diverse. Mm. Not just the repertoire, but as much as I can in regards to just people. Right, okay, all right. Awesome, awesome. Um, Tyrone, I'd like to start with you first in terms of that, that, um, that repertory, that, that, that diverseness, that, that I, I always say, tell people that the way we were raised, like Balanchine was never the highest. He was as high as Billy Wilson, Jeffrey Holder, everyone occupied as an artist in our heads, the same place. Um, and it's not like that everywhere. Um, can you comment on that? And, and, and if anyone else wants to jump in. Well, I, well, for me personally, I think, you know, what's, what the, the advantage that we have, because we all are directors, we have that opportunity to shape and mold, not to change who these dancers really are as a person or how they dance, but to really dig deep inside and see what works for them. What can we do to to stroke them, to encourage them to do, to do their best, best. Because what we don't want to do is be, be one of those directors that Mickey Mouse, that we want to look like another company, or we want to dance like another dancer. It's like, let me look at Susie, John, and Mary and say, okay, what is it that they do best? Let's work on that. Let's build yes. on that. Wow. That's, that's, that's what's important. And that's mm -hmm. what makes it stand out because that's what Mr. Mitchell did with us. Exactly. You know, the went up and there were different shades of brown. Yes. And some of us were not suited for certain roles, but we got a chance to dance. Yes. You know, there were many times I wanted to do some of the more classical things, but he saw and later on just said that was not for Tyrone Brooks, but what he gave me to dance was for me. And I yes. did it well. Yes. And that's the, the, important. And that, 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 the art. Right. The, the art of that generation, I would say, of artistic directors was, I, I include Mr. Balanchine in that uh, space as well, um, being able to identify what is best as opposed to trying to look like something or someone else. Um, I saw some heads nodding. Kevin, are you, do you have a couple words for that subject? Yes, I mean, it's, it's important to, um, as Tyrone said, works on the dancers that are in front of, you know, what makes them look the best. Mm -hmm. And also to, to highlight, like right now, you know, the importance mm -hmm. of highlighting choreographers who look like us. <laughs> I yeah. think that's what's most important to me right now. Awesome. You know, we, do, yes. we do shape. We do shape what dancers look like. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Those are. It is up to us to put the right. Yes. All right. Uh, Jarena, at the Opera House in in New Orleans, the, the uh, are you you work with dancers there? Uh, what is that experience like, and and uh, and how has your experience at Dancing Harlem impacted that? It's so funny you ask that. Um, before the pandemic, I had a, one time I talked with the dancers and I said, look, I can only be a ballet master conduct re rehearsal with the knowledge I have. And the knowledge I have is from what I learned at the Institute of Harlem. And so for me, standards are very high. I want everybody high energy on the studio. I do think um, that, you know, Drive for Excellency comes also from working at DTH and under mm -hmm. 
Dr. Mitchell, Tyrone, Levine, there was always that drive for excellency. And it was something, it's something that I always try to get with my company, with the company that I work with. Um, I really enjoy also laughter and good humor. And that was something that when I moved to DTH, I thought I, I found home because I felt that it was a, just a little, just light enough that you could be yourself and you yes. didn't have to pose. <laughs> <laughs> it's so important. You, you all know I love a good joke. Yes, exactly, exactly. You know? Yeah, there was no pretense, no pretense. And not have fun. You know, this is uh, something that always comes up when, when we do these panels. People, I, I tell people, because at the time when we were working, there, there were very large companies. And when I tell people like we were like a family, some people really think that I'm making it up. I've even heard that, oh, that's a cliche. Nobody's that way. But it's not true at all. Um, I, you know, I, Nina's partner in crime was Miss Kelly Saunders, who was Kelly Gordon at the time. Yeah. Um, Louise, can you talk about that, that, that family thing? And then Nikki, I would like you to follow up. Oh, absolutely. I think- Well, your I, sister was in the company, hello. I mean, well, that's how, that's why I ended up there. You know, I followed uh, my family, I followed Elena. She had the drive and she was very lucky. She was incredibly lucky to, Carol Shook uh, offered her uh, uh, to, to be there and, and she just had to wait for the approval of Mr. Mitchell. How lucky are you to, to, to be able to, to land a job right out of the bat? Uh, and then she met her husband, much like Waverly and Nina, you know, I'm at Dance Theater of Harlem. So did I. I met my wife at Dance Theater of Harlem. Yes. You know? And so when you talk about family, yeah, we took that very, we took that, it, it was, it was that. What I, what I'm having a little bit of problems right now with kind of like getting it in my head is that the generation now is different. I mean, this is the crystal generation. And I wonder how it would have affected these kids on this generation having to deal with somebody like Arthur Mitchell, which would not, would not let you get away with having your freaking hand on the hip. <laughs> You'd be out of the studio, you know? Yeah, that's right, Louise. Louise keeping it 100, y'all, as <laughs> usual. <laughs> Nikki. <laughs> Nikki. Yes. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I think that um, just the, the sheer hours, you know, um, at the school that I had, especially with the older kids, I'm with them sometimes more than their parents are. And um, they're with each other. So it's really beautiful to see that the relationships develop over time and um, to see them looking out for each other. But it comes from the top down. I think of them as my children. And I te mm. treat them like that. And they, I mean, Mr. Brooks is, <laughs> I say Mr. Brooks, Tyrone. <laughs> Tyrone is one I think, but I mean, that's how to write. Tyrone was my daddy too. You know, it's just like you take care of your children and then they take care right. of each other. And that's just the, the tradition that we were raised in and you can't help but pass it down. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, Nina. <laughs> a little teary. <laughs> uh, I saw that, oh my God. I was going there with you. <laughs> Nina. I want to add that also we had our extended family like Lewis Johnson. Mr. Mitchell brought so many great people around oh. to choreograph. And when we left New York and we were in Atlanta, Lewis came to a, a, Atlanta and it was amazing. He was with Dr. Richard Long. And what people don't know is we tried to talk Lewis Johnson into starting a company in Atlanta. And he is the one who said, you guys should do it. We said, we don't know how to do this. He said, you know the best part, the dance. So I'm eternally grateful for all of the extended family. Carmen DeLavala came to Atlanta and came to our studio. So Mr. Mitchell gave us so many great extended family members. Mel, Tomlin. Mel Tomlinson. I mean, Karen Brown, like so many people circulated through our lives from that, from, for me, from that short amount of time that we were in New York, these lifelong connections who helped to enhance our lives. I mean, I, I can't even talk about the impact that Lewis had, Lewis Johnson had on my life from being able to do the pas de trois of forces and that 
building that confidence in so many ways, Mr. Mitchell was really brilliant for really enhancing the power of the black culture. He made us understand that we could be in the forefront and not the background. And we took that with us and we're still running with it and yeah. how to tell powerful stories. Yes, absolutely. Um, I would like to say that if people are, oh, I, I, I have a, a message that Miss Karen is watching right now. All right, so on your best behavior, KB is in the house. Hey, KB, see, I mentioned her name. Everyone, uh, uh, I, I, well, I would like to say to the people watching, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, and, and we will take a look at them. Um, okay, now to specifics. Um, a lot of times Mr. Mitchell was chided for quote unquote oversimplifying things, but I find that tip of the toe and third finger do work. A picture. Yeah. Everything. <laughs> How about thinking about the X, all of those things that he gave us? I mean, uh, 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 I like uh, someone uh, jump in. What What do you use of his? What have you stolen shamelessly so he can send a thunderbolt down? Oh, cheekbone <laughs> to the light. Cheekbone yes, to the light. <laughs> cheekbone to the light. Oh, that's so wild. You know, it's. Toe. What was that? The big back toe for PK Arabesque. The big back toe for PK Arabesque. <laughs> <laughs> one of mine is when he always talked about, as far as rotation turning out, when he when he um, would say, it's like pulling apart a chicken wing. You know, chicken leg, you know? Yes, <laughs> right. that part. <laughs> that, 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 that energy, that uh, distance with, with mm -hmm. the whole thing. Yes. Exactly. Breaking the hip for arabesque. I mm -hmm. arabesque. That breaking mm -hmm. the hip for arabesque. And when I teach, you must have your back up, period. And I still demonstrate back up. I mean, no. that left a forever impact in my life. <laughs> <laughs> right. No ironing board. No, no, I no ironing it. board. The fickle finger of fate. The fickle finger of fate, yes. <laughs> the, um, one foot one foot above your middle finger for arabesque. That That's right. Finger. That's right. Tyrone, yeah. you said one earlier, though, that 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 I forgot. What was that you said? I forget what it was. I, I, what was it? Also finger to toe for arabesque. That's it. Finger to toe. Arabesque, we spent. Finger to toe. <laughs> we would spend hours on arabesque. Go on toes. Get your back up. Fast. <laughs> quickly and that finger needed yeah. to be high and you needed to be all at once it could exactly be slow yeah, yeah. Robert, Robert and um Tyrone I don't uh, Luis also I don't know if you all remember remember the tour to Berkeley we did Troy game and and Dougla both but um the coupe jeté oh god everybody else got to go to lunch I didn't <laughs> Mr. Mitchell kept yeah. me yeah. On stage, and I remember him eating this sandwich, tuna fish sandwich, <laughs> <laughs> and tell me, coupe jeté, coupe jeté. He, he made sure that I, and now, I when I teach coupe jeté, it is meticulous. Yes. <laughs> you know, one of, one of the things that amazes me is that, like, like Robert was talking about, uh, Mr. Mitchell was there teaching class almost all the time. And then he was there at the theater watching the watching the performance all the time. And then he was there for notes. And then he was there for everything. And I'm like, how how did he keep it so? Right. How, how how did he he didn't go crazy, you know? And it was he was on the moment. He was there and he was for real, you know, trying to make you get it. I just Every, how, yeah. I would say I would say that every performance for him uh, was in, in class was an opportunity for growth. He he never he made us not take it for granted, which was really wonderful. You know, uh, there's there's a question that's come through the chat. Um, thank you, Jane, that just says, has anyone compiled all these memorable and useful Mr. Mitchellisms for teaching and learning? That would be awesome. That would be awesome. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think we're long overdue for trying to figure out how to make that happen. Yeah. You know, it's funny, um, in, in the year 2000, we did a collaboration with New York City Ballet. And 
one of the things in the program was slaughter on 10th Avenue. And so we did a panel discussion a couple months back uh, with Damian Wetzel, who was coached by Arthur Mitchell for that performance. And, and Damian said, I have my Arthur Mitchell story. And he said, when I walked in on stage, he goes like, nope. <laughs> and, he, and then he said, again, try, he goes, nope. And then he said, Damien, when you come out on the stage, you gotta let the light hit your cheekbones. And he said, oh, you know, and, and it said it changed his whole attitude towards the role. You know, um, these things are actually quite profound. And I, what I love about them is the simplicity of them. Yeah. Um, and, and, and how, you know, he doesn't get caught up in a, he hated overwrought, overcomplicated things. And, and affectations. And affectations, yeah. Do yeah. you remember he used to tell us not to purse our lips together? I remember. And I to, think, to put our tongue to the roof of our mouth? Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. I, I don't know. know. That's true. That's true. Exactly, 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 exactly. Uh, he was reading, after a performance, he was reading Ugh Jean after, but he, because he thought he was breathing too loud. And he was telling him, <laughs> That's such a cheap shot, Oog. Just keep it under control. <laughs> yeah. You know? Right. Exactly. Because the art came first. Yeah. yeah. The art came first. Although it was probably exhausted. I but... know. I get it. I get it. You know, how did he die and collapse? That's a different story, you know? Exactly. Um, um, one of the things that I do um, love about um, watching our teachers go into the world is that, for instance, like SAB has a teacher training uh, collaborative. I think Nikki's done it. Some folks here have participated. And, um, and I'm always very proud to see that Nina and Waverly as well. I'm really proud to always see that the majority of people that are always chosen are us because we were the people making teachers, you know? And so one of the things that's a really big deal for me right now is finding teachers that did have the experience of Arthur Mitchell because now there's a generation that will never know him. They'll only know him through listen to this. They only know him through the classes that you teach. Yeah, so, 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 so with that said, um, any other recollections before we move on or move out of this? It's 626, I haven't, oh, wait, I have another question. Remember the rocket chaka when he would go, rocket chaka, rocket chaka, rocket chaka, chaka, and zah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> The foot exercise. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you know, and, well, you know what, Nina, the thing is, we sound the same, but the funny thing is, all those old City Valley people sound the same as well. Yeah. Suzanne Farrell teaches that way. Um, Jacques yeah. Demois, God bless his soul, taught that way, really. Mm -hmm. um, the gentleman from Miami City, Eddie Villela, also mm -hmm. that same rhythmic way. Um, I don't know what that is, but yeah, but we do have one more question or comment from Ms. Karen Brown. Uh, she says, great seeing all of you together on this pet on your roles as artistic directors. Uh, as you think of your own legacy, what are you doing to prepare your dancers who might be interested in pursuing a, a career as an artistic director? Um, and then of course, uh, well, Karen, yes. <laughs> uh, but preparing leadership, Preparing leadership. Have you met someone in your life where you're like, this one will end up being a good teacher. This one will have any of you. And 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 what? Have you, how have you helped that, Louise? You're not in your head. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in because I just recently we uh, were able to provide a full contract year round to one of my original dancers in the company when we brought the company back, the Lexington Ballet, a Japanese dancer, uh, Ayako Hasebe absolutely brilliant well you know the japanese are by the culture meticulous meticulous and uh, perfectionist and, and just beautiful and and i think that the answer is opportunity you know you let them let them develop a program let them choreograph the ballet let them bring ideas to the table that's how i'm doing it and i'm absolutely thrilled with with the results because you give them an opportunity, you get them engaged and they fly. They take it places that you didn't even think about. Yes, absolutely. Anyone else? Anyone else? Uh, you know, I, I, yeah. oh, 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 I'm sorry, Jermaine. Well, I was, I was going to say that 
And then again, depending where you are working, if your city has a lot of resources and dancers, it's easy to hire, it's easy to uh, get teachers and support, but sometimes you have to bring them up because there's just no choice. And, and I felt that when I opened my school here, I was uh, sometimes the teachers will uh, miss t a class and call me 15 minutes before class and tell me they were not gonna teach Oh, so I and I, I was like, okay, we are going to do a training session. We will do a month and I will train you how to teach class. And if I get a 15 minute call, I will be texting you and you will be teaching that class because I'm not always available if I'm not here to to sub for those teachers. Precisely. And, and so one of the things that I learned from that experience was I have a lot of us have to train people in everything, let them spot you when you're doing your emails and let's spot you when you're doing scheduling and you literally create an, a, a community of people that know a little bit of what you do because what, what I did was so much sometimes that you, just <laughs> need to, you know spread yes. the wealth and and how do you build a community you have to see who's interested and who actually is as relentless as you are on doing this job. Yes, yes, you have to be dedicated. Uh, Kevin, any anything in your neck of the woods with that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically uh, giving young students um, leadership roles and, you know, letting them or let them show you what they can do and, you know, yes. offering them opportunities. I mean, that's that's how you, you know, as Mr. Mitchell would say, um, let the let the youth lead the way. That's how you do it. So you know, a lot of the times, you know, the talent is right under our nose and we don't realize it. You know, once we open our arms and invite them in, then you learn so much. For example, the dancers came to me last season, well, season before last, because of, you know, uh, the pandemic. He said, Mr. Brooks, can we do an evening? of dance with just us. I'm like, if you can fit in the schedule, certainly. So they choreographed, they all choreographed, not all of them, but there was a group that choreographed and did part of this, part of, part of twas. Some did contemporary work, some did uh, classical work, and they invited close friends. And, I, and from there, I learned that we have choreographers in the company. So for our opening season, it's called the Evening of Music and, of music and Dance. It's done with a small chamber orchestra. Two of them did a performance, choreographed for a performance. So now I've decided this is going to be the vehicle for the Tallahassee Valley dancers, opposed to hiring choreographers to come in for the first of the season. Of course. To utilize what I have there. Wow. That's how you develop folks, man. Yeah. They just have to do it, you know? If they're interested, um, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Nina and Waverly, any leadership coaching you do? Have you raised, I'm sure in 30 years you have. <laughs> time and time again, from being dancers with no audience when we moved to Atlanta, all the dancers had to learn everything. We taught all the classes performed and scheduled things around that. And we still look at people who have the interest. We have several mentees that have jobs around the studio. They may be in charge of our cultural cul-de-sac outdoor performances and they put that together and call their friends. Um, that's part of it. And then as Jarena said, we have them shadow us in the various mm -hmm. components of what we do so that they see that in order to create great art, there's a balance of the administration, marketing, fundraising, mm -hmm. so that they can learn all the components. And then we see, you know, who really wants to fall into it. It's very tough. Some of the people we've scared away and it's scary because I do give them a lot of feedback. Some people can take it. Some people mm -hmm. can't take it, you know. <laughs> I, I am my father's <laughs> child, Mr. Mitchell. So, you know, exactly, so exactly. who rises and who stays. What did he always say about the cream rise and all mm -hmm. that stuff? You know? Yes, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. And Nikki, yeah. what, about, what about you? I, I know that, like you said, you started teaching here, you know, uh, and so moving in that direction, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm, Nikki, why do I remember you doing a lecture demonstration? Did you ever host one or? Yeah. yeah, no, I did. Um, I And that was the thing, you know, at DTH, I had the opportunity to not just be a dancer, but to teach. Um, I ran the summer intensive 
in New York yes. two summers mm -hmm. and also in Detroit. And that was, you know, the first time I did it, I was like, I am never running a school. This is for the, this is for the, <laughs> it's like a lot of work, um, but here I am, you know, um, and it's because of that experience that I was able to move into um, having a school. And my son was two months old at the time when I um, took over the school here in New Orleans in 2015. And, um, but it was because of the opportunity, you know, like Luis was saying, if you don't have the opportunity, you're clueless. And I've learned a lot running my own business, but um, I, I had something to start from. Um, at, at my school, I have older students who are junior teachers. So I pick kids when I think that they're ready to come in um, and, you know, they try to just demonstrate. And I'm like, no, you need to get in there and you have to touch them and you have to fix their feet and you have to point. So they're learning to teach. Um, that usually starts with 12 year olds and, um, and it goes through high school. So um, by the time they're done with high school, if they've really paid attention and they've done a good job, they should be able to go in and teach or have an idea of how to teach a ballet class. Which right. Is really important. Um, and, you know, helping with backstage when we have performances and all of that. Um, right, right. It's learn, uh, how, learn how to jump that Marley. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 How to lay your own Marley was a part of the training. Absolutely. Yes. They have to yes. jump it. They have to tape it. You know, it's time to change the tape in the studio. Okay, let's get it together, guys. Come on, let's go. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and that's one of the things that we we have to do because a lot of through the pandemic, a lot of the performances we did were outside. And one of the things here in Atlanta, I wanted to make sure that we're not dancing on concrete. And right. so what I did is we have our sprung floor. And so we put it together. Some of the guys from my dance sphere development project, they helped me put that floor together so that we Jesus. can perform out at city hall, uh, at different venues, if we want it to in the middle of the street, because that we have that floor. And so wow. invested in, and you know, you know, it's those things like that, that they have to understand the mentality of an entrepreneur because this is what has made us survive, not waiting for someone to do it for us, but doing for self. Amen, amen. Wow. Yeah. On that note, <laughs> uh, I think that we're ready to wrap up, guys. This is not the last time we will do this kind of panel. It's very important for people to see and hear, um, not only that Arthur Mitchell was a man that made a company for Black dancers or that he was really beautiful, but that he really had a methodology about his work and, uh, and the seriousness. Um, and so uh, uh, thank you so much, Ms. Ebony Pittman, our Senior Director of Development, and I will throw it back over to you. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, Waverly, Nina, Nikki, Kevin, Luis, Tyrone, and Jarena. Thank you so much for your time today and for joining this Summerside Chat. And thank you to our virtual audience for logging in. Our DTH donors, you all are incredibly important to us. We help to ensure that our company, our students, and our dedicated staff can continue to bring high quality programming to our audiences across the globe. I ask that you please consider going online to dancetheaterparlum.org and making a contribution today. No gift is too small. Uh, I also hope that you all will continue, will consider joining us next Wednesday for our final summer site chat of this series, uh, which will be moderated by Artistic Director Virginia Johnson. And we will be exploring our wonderful and important program, Women Who Move Us, which provides a platform for women choreographers in classical ballet. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a good evening.